Hello everyone, today we are going to Victorian England to look at a case that shook the capital. So sit back as we go to late 19th century London. Mary Eleanor Wheeler was born in 1866. Her childhood was not an easy one and in 1882 when she was 16 years old her father James Wheeler had been in an accident at work. He was carried back to the house he shared with his wife and two daughters, but his injuries were so severe that he died 48 hours later. Mary and her mother went to live in Kentish Town. When Mary was 19, she started having a relationship with a carpenter named John Charles Piercy, and although they never married, Mary decided to take his name and became known as Mary Piercy. She continued to use his name even after they parted. Mary was known to suffer from depression. She attempted to take her own life on two occasions and she drunk heavily. She also suffered from seizures. Mary only had her mother and her older sister as relatives and the sad event of the death of their father seemed to cast a shadow over the three women. Mary did not work, preferring to extract money from wealthy men who spent a lot of time in her company. She would receive gentlemen visitors on a regular basis, all of whom were known to her and were regular visitors to her home. One of these male friends was called Charles Creighton, who in 1888 rented rooms for her at 2 Priory Street. Mr Creighton only visited her once a week, so she had lots of time to see other admirers. One such person was called Frank Samuel Hogg, who was a furniture remover. He impressed Mary, as he was well dressed and had his own business. Frank, however, had a wife named Phoebe Hogg. Phoebe was known to Mary, and they considered each other to be friends. Frank and Phoebe married in November 1888, when Phoebe was three months pregnant and gave birth to their daughter in the summer of 1889. They named their daughter Phoebe. Frank had been seeing Mary before he was married and continued the relationship during the pregnancy and after his daughter was born. Mary knew that her situation wasn't ideal. She really wanted to be like other women her age, married and with a husband who looked after her. On the morning of October the 24th, 1890, Mary asked a young boy named William Holmes to run an errand for her. She gave him a penny for delivering a note to her friend Phoebe, inviting her to tea that afternoon. Frank was at work, so at 3pm Phoebe started to get herself and her baby ready so she could walk to Mary's house. She left her house at around 4pm. Later that afternoon, Mary's neighbour, Charlotte Priddington, heard a sound of breaking glass coming from Mary's house and called over the fence to check that she was okay, but she received no reply. At 7pm, a woman's body was discovered lying on a pavement in Crossfield Road by a man returning from work, and he reported it to a local policeman. The woman's head was wrapped in a cardigan, which when removed by the policeman, uncovered a very blood-stained face, and her throat had been cut. Assistance was called for, and the body was removed and taken to Hampstead Police Station, and then onto the morgue. An autopsy discovered that as well as the obvious injuries, the deceased also had a fractured skull, and there were also bruises on the head and arms. This was consistent with her having been attacked and trying to defend herself. The police examined the place where the body was found and concluded that the murder must have taken place elsewhere. The first task, however, was to identify the body. Later that evening, a police constable discovered a heavily blood-stained pram about a mile from where the woman's body was found. The following morning, the body of a small child was discovered. The child, a girl, was found to have died from suffocation. The story of the woman's body was reported in the newspaper, and Frank Hogg, on hearing of the discovery of the woman's body, went to the police station to report his wife missing. First, though, he went to his sister Clara's house 
so she would go with him. After the visit to the police station, Frank sent Clara to see Mary to inquire if she had seen Phoebe. Mary denied having seen Phoebe, but agreed to accompany Clara to the morgue to see if the woman who had been written about in the paper was in fact Phoebe. Mary's behaviour there was very strange, having agreed to accompany Clara. When they were shown the body, Mary reportedly said, no, that's not her, and told Clara not to look, but Clara identified the clothes her sister-in-law was wearing. The police asked Mary and Clara to view the pram, which Clara identified as belonging to Phoebe. Clara then looked at the body and told the police that it was a body of her sister-in-law, Phoebe Hogg. Frank was informed that the body found at Crossfield Road was that of his wife. But he did not appear to be particularly upset over Phoebe's death, so the police decided he was a suspect and searched his house. They did not find very much, but one thing of interest was a key that did not fit any locks in Frank's house. Reluctantly, he admitted to the police that it was a door key to Mary Pierce's house. When asked why he would have such a key, Frank told the police about his ongoing relationship with Mary. The police decided to interview Mary. She had acted very strangely at the mortuary and being the other woman in a love triangle was motive enough for them to pay her a visit at her house in Priory Street. When they arrived, they found bloodstains in the kitchen together with a bloodstained carving knife and a fire poker. There was also clear signs of a struggle, with two broken windows in the kitchen. A rug with light bloodstains smelt strongly of paraffin, where an attempt had been made to clean it. Mary's behaviour was also very bizarre during the search. She sat at her piano, singing and whistling loudly, and attempted to explain away the bloodstains by saying that she had been killing mice. Detective Inspector Bannister decided that the evidence gathered was strong enough to arrest Mary and charge her on two counts of murder. Mary was then searched and bloodstains were found on her clothes. There were also scratches on her hands and she was wearing two wedding rings, one of which was later identified as Phoebe's. Mary was kept in custody and appeared at a committal hearing on the 28th of October for a magistrate to hear the evidence against her and commit her for trial. The police considered whether they had a case against Frank Hogg. They wondered if he had conspired to do away with his inconvenient wife and child and return to his lover. But Frank had a very good alibi for his whereabouts on the day of the murder and there was lack of evidence against him. Despite the fact he was not charged, he did not escape the public suspicion and he was shouted at every time he ventured out. Mary's trial began at the Central Criminal Court of the Old Bailey on December the 1st, 1890. She entered a formal plea of not guilty and then the prosecution began to outline its case against her. They read out various letters that Mary had written to Frank Hogg, which were claimed to show the depth of her passion for him prior to his forced marriage to Phoebe due to her pregnancy Mary had told Frank that even if she had to marry Phoebe, she did not want him to leave her, and that she would treat Phoebe as a friend. One letter read, I love you with all my heart, and I will love her, because she will belong to you. The suggestive motive for the murder was jealousy of Phoebe, now that Mary had to share Frank with her. Evidence was also given regarding the place of the crime, and the nature and method of how Mary had caused Phoebe's injuries. John Piercy, who was Mary's ex-boyfriend, identified the cardigan found wrapped around Phoebe's head when her body was found as the one he had given to Mary. Evidence of premeditation was given to the court, the written invite to Mrs Hogg to come to tea and the alleged pulling down of the blinds to provide privacy during the attack. But what was it that made Mary attack Phoebe so brutally? Did they argue over Frank? Or was it something one of them had said that started an argument? The prosecution brought in a witness named Sarah Sawhill, who was looking after Mary while she was in police custody awaiting the committal hearing. Allegedly, she told Sarah that Mrs Hogg had indeed come to tea that afternoon and that as they were having tea, Mrs Hogg had made a remark 
but offended her. So an argument started. According to Mrs. Sawhill, Mary then realised that she was incriminating herself and stopped talking. A neighbour of Mary's and several other witnesses testified that on the evening of the murder, they saw Mary pushing a pram through the crowded streets of Kentish Town. The pram seemed to be carrying an unusually heavy load. The prosecution suggested that the baby had died either by being suffocated during or after the murder of her mother, or alternatively being placed in the pram alive with her mother's body on top of her, and that it was the weight of her mother's body that suffocated her. The defence lawyer questioned the circumstantial evidence against Mary, and also whether a woman of her size and build would be capable of inflicting such injuries on the deceased. Mary gave no evidence at the trial, and remained impassive throughout. After three days, the jury were asked to consider the verdict, and after just 52 minutes, returned to find the defendant, Mary Piercy, guilty. In accordance with normal practice, Mary was asked if she had anything to say why the court should not give her the judgment of death in accordance with the law. Mary replied, I say I am innocent of this charge. The judge, Mr Justice Denman, then put on the black cap and sentenced her to death by hanging. There was no appeal process in 1890. In fact, it was not until 1907 that the Court of Criminal Appeal was set up. However, a solicitor made a considerable effort to save her, alleging that she was not in control of herself at the time of the killing, and this was due to the seizures that she had suffered since birth. On the 16th of December, the Home Office wrote to her legal representative, informing him that a medical inquiry under the Criminal Lunatics Act had been granted. This was to be carried out on the Friday by three doctors. The doctors spent an hour with Mary, and after due consideration, found her to be sane. While in Newgate Prison awaiting her fate, Frank Hogg was given permission to visit Mary. She sat nervously, hoping that he would visit her for one last time, but Frank never arrived. Mary was very upset and wept all evening. On her final afternoon, Mary was visited by her solicitor, whom she asked to deal with certain bequests, and also to place a personal advert for her. The advert was to read, M-E-C-P, Last Wish of M-E-W, Have Not Betrayed. M-E-W, presumably meaning Mary Eleanor Wheeler, which was of course her birth name. When asked what this meant, Mary refused to elaborate on the meaning of the message. Mary never confessed to the murders, despite persistent questioning from both her legal team and her mother. On Tuesday, the 23rd of December, 1890, three female guards arrived to take Mary to the gallows. She told them she didn't need assistance and would be able to walk by herself, but the guards told her it was a legal requirement that she be escorted. Mary replied, Oh well, if you don't mind going with me, I am pleased. And then she kissed all three women before the procession started from the cell along the corridor and across the yard to the gallows. Outside the prison, on an extremely cold December morning, a crowd of 300 people including many women, had gathered to witness the sound of St Stephen's church bell and the raising of the black flag above the prison to denote that the execution had been carried out. Mary evoked little public sympathy and there was a cheer from the crowd as the flag was hoisted. She was buried later in the day in an unmarked grave within Newgate Prison. Following the execution, Madame Tussauds made a wax model of her for their chamber of horrors and purchased the pram from Frank Hogg together with some other effects. Hello everyone. This week the channel went past 10,000 subscribers, which is amazing, especially as the channel only had 5,000 subscribers at the end of December. I would like to thank everyone who has subscribed to this channel or who has just listened to videos and who has supported the channel's growth over the last seven months. It really does mean a lot to me. 
So thank you so much. And I will see you in the next brief case.